So um, let me talk about uh, this guy's performance. Now, this is where I do um, agree um, with, uh, you know, I still think the movie was bloody enjoyable. I really do. I really, really enjoyed uh, the movie. The Joker was not my favourite character in the movie. Okay. Should the Joker be one of your favourite characters in the movie if the Joker's in a, in a movie? Yeah. Was I disappointed a bit that I didn't enjoy this Joker as much? Or it wasn't, it didn't live up to what I expected? Yeah. Can I take away my kind of fanboyish thing and say, hey, wait a second, isn't it a bit entitled that I feel like if the Joker wasn't good in this movie and there wasn't... I mean, I remember there was a story online that surfaced a few days after that said that one of the fans wanted to sue... <laughs> they wanted to sue Warner Brothers uh, because there wasn't enough Joker in the movie. And um, so they wanted to sue Warner Brothers over this. And isn't that a little bit entitled? I mean, it's a movie. They're making a movie, and they said it was false advertising. It's not called The Joker, so how was it false advertising? If it was called The Joker and The Joker isn't in it, then maybe you've got a point to, to see, the, to see uh, Warner Brothers, or, you know. But um, it, was, it, it was never promised, it was never stated. You know, if, if um, Warner Brothers had have come out with a statement saying The Joker is going to be in this movie for at least 30 or 40 minutes and he wasn't then maybe again you might have a case it's ludicrous whatever the way you want to look at it that you could care that much but there's not enough joker in the movie now having said all of that stuff about my disappointment with the joker the disappointment with the joker didn't come from the performance came from how it was put together. Clearly, there were bits missing, um, you know, from um, the, the the script. Now, there's two things you could say towards this. Uh, sorry, the two, uh, missing from the editing. Now, you might say, oh, well, now you're contradicting yourself, nerd man. You just said, like, the editing was fine, but now you're saying the editing ruined the Joker's performance. Well, the editing may have ruined the Joker's performance, but it didn't ruin the movie, so... Let, let's let's get that out of the way but um also now um when it comes to the editing of this movie we have to remember one thing this movie is a direct response <laughs> to what you were saying what, what what all these fanboys and critics and all these people were like shouting at the top of their lungs about um uh, batman v superman they were saying it was too dark, it's too gritty, there's enough humour. Uh, where, where's, the, where's, the, where's, the, where's the humour? Where's the kind of light-sided thing? So they did reshoots to make uh, fans and people happy. And I think the humour in this movie uh, worked a lot better and was a lot funnier um, than a lot of Marvel movies. I, I think it wasn't forced, it wasn't kind of third wall kind of breaking where it's like, it's, it, it was all, it all kind of emanated naturally from the characters rather than, uh, you know, kind of trying to mock themselves. And, and this, is, this is what I don't like actually about the Justice League trailer because um, actually they're starting to go into this kind of third wall breaking with, um, you know, uh, Bruce Wayne kind of smiling at Aquaman saying, you know, I, anyway, so because of the response to Batman v Superman and how much people were saying, oh, it's dark, it's scary, oh, God, what about the children? What did DC and, uh, and, and Warner Brothers do? They cut together a version which isn't um, so uh, dark, which isn't so gritty, um, and obviously we know when the, when the joke gets dark, and the Joker gets, you know, psychotic. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Joker is is a pretty dark, scary character. I remember when I went to go and see The Dark Knight, 
apparently um, uh, what uh, what uh, uh, Jared Leto does in this movie is even worse than The Dark Knight. Like I've heard some of the deleted scenes and what he's doing is like, you know, hitting Harley Quinn and you know all of this kind of stuff. They have an abusive relationship and all of this kind of thing. I went to The Dark Knight and I saw uh, this dad bringing his kid. And um, the Joker started screaming at the screen, you know, um, and then, he, you know, it went dark and uh, there was a bit where you can, Batman's looking at the Joker and he's in, um, you know, that kind of um, sonar vision. And it was just like, even I was a bit frightened of it. It was like out of a fucking horror movie. And uh, this kid was just crying. <laughs> the kid was like 11 years old. He was just crying. The dad just was like laughing and kind of was like, oh man, oh, come on, come on, you know, and, uh, and had him leave. So th th they took the scary bits of the Joker out, you know, and people w were reacting to that. And what do we do? We start complaining about them taking the bits of the Joker out. We start complaining about them taking the dark and gritty bits out and making it more fun and, um, up, uh, and upbeat, which is what it what basically was while keeping some sense of the kind of darkness that's appropriate to the Suicide Squad. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, if you want to blame anyone for the Joker's <laughs> performance being removed, blame the bloody critics. You criticised Batman v Superman. Blame Warner Brothers a little bit for um, caving in and listening to uh, those critics instead of sticking by the original vision of the, um, of the director. Now, um, my next point is this, the, <clears throat> the Enchantress <laughs> is a terrible villain. Um, so, well, I've got two points to this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get through this um, really, really quickly. Now, I'm gonna say something very, very, there's gonna be three points to this. First of all, I'm gonna, I wanna say to Cara Delevingne, I apologise for how cruel people are being to you because it's absolutely, absolutely taken way, way out of uh, out of proportion to what that performance was. What was she? She's a basic witch. She was visually. L let's just take the performance out of it. Visually, the Enchantress was very, very interesting, spectacular. Everyone talks about the hand scene. Everyone loves that hand scene when it come kind of comes through. Uh, really, really cool, visually spectacular scene and, and generally just a visually spectacular popping um, out of the screen um, villain. Um, was her plot basic and, you know, uh, not very uh, kind of um, generic by the end? Yeah, sure it was. But like in the end, Car Cara Delevingne played three separate characters in this movie. And each one of them were distinct to me. I didn't see Cara Delevingne. I saw the Enchantress. Now, whether you like the Enchantress or not, you know, that, that's your own issue. But when I see Cara Delevingne as a person, you know, I see no relationship to what I saw on screen. And to me, that's good acting. When she was June Moon, she was distinct and different. When she was the scary, weird uh, witch, um, uh, you know, um, version of Enchantress, she was very, very different and, and, and menacing as far as I'm concerned. Um, she, she was creepy, really, really creepy. And uh, finally, when she was the, um, you know, the, 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 the kind of uh, over, the, 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 the kind of, um, how would you put it, empress kind of version of um, Enchantress as well. Uh, she was, um, you know, really, really uh, fantastic. Uh, sorry, uh, she was not really fantastic, but she was uh, disappeared and was completely different to those two other characters that she was playing in the movie. I thought she did a fantastic job. And this is another one of those things where like, everyone says, oh, well, Enchantress was bad, Enchantress was bad, Enchantress was bad. And then I start, I start asking them about it. So I'm like, so do you think, like when you see Cara Delevingne, have you ever seen an interview with her? Oh, let me show you an interview. I show them a little interview and I'm like, does that, does that seem to you like how she was on screen? 
So how's she a bad actress? Because that's, that's a different... She's, she's just taken and embraced this role completely and done something, you know, that, that, that's completely... Uh, she is Enchantress. You might not like the character. You might think that character's just a generic villain. But as far as her performance is concerned, I don't see how she could have done it any better. Now, there's this whole controversy of the popping and locking, okay? And I'm like, apparently she's doing some weird movements and it's so distracting from the movie and that's what the main kind of contention of her performance is. What? What? What movie are you watching? I never saw anything that she did that was so offensive to my senses that I would think that, you know, the movie somehow suffered from it. She, there was nothing distracting about what she was doing. I, I don't even know what this is. This is just pure hate. Like, this is a new girl. Maybe she's a model. People think, oh, she's a model. She can't act. She can't act. She... Let me tell you something about actresses. They are some of the most beautiful people physically on earth. Okay. Um, now, I'm not saying this is like I celebrate beauty of, uh, um, you know, I, 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 and I think actresses are all fucking fantastic or anything like that. I don't give a fuck about beautiful, whether a woman's beautiful or not. It doesn't bother me. I don't treat them any differently. I don't think they're special. It's nothing to do with that. But actresses generally are some of the most beautiful people on earth. So it's only logically uh, speaking that some of them are going to have been models. Okay? So the fact that she's a model has nothing to do with whether she's a good actress or not. She could be a bad actress and have been a, a, a model. She could be a good actress and have been a model. Um, she, you know, she, you can have a, a, an actress who was never a model who's a bad actress. It's, it, 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 it's, it's completely uh, ridiculous. And also, the reason people hate the Enchantress, this is the real reason. I'll, I'm going to tell you the absolute real reason people hate the Enchantress. It's because they're entitled, entitled pricks, right? Who, some of them, not all of you, some of you genuinely don't like her, I'll give you that. But some of them are entitled pricks who were like, eh, the villain wasn't the Joker. We didn't get enough Joker. We didn't get enough Joker, even though we didn't like the performance of the Joker. So why do we want more of him? But we didn't get enough Joker. So we're just going to hate on the villain. It could have been any villain. The fact it wasn't the Joker, that's what they hated about it. That is exactly what they hated about it. They were disappointed. They were hyped up to see... Um, you know, uh, um, another uh, performance of the Joker that could match up to Heath Ledger's and they didn't see that. So they just were like, fuck this villain, she's terrible. Look at her dancing. Wow, what's she doing with her belly? Fuck off. All right, so... And also, yeah, the last point on this... As far as I'm concerned, you know, how, let's talk about this, because actually Suicide Squad, in my honest opinion, has the best villain in a comic book movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're going to look at me like, what, what, the f what, are you, what is this guy about to say? You're sharpening your knives right now. This movie has the best comic book villain in a movie in a comic book movie since The Dark Knight. Boom. Drop, drop the mic. What am I talking about? Surely you can't be talking about the Enchantress. Okay, you, you know, nerd man, you like the Enchantress. You, you like the Enchantress a lot, but come on, man. You're not, you're not really telling me you think she's the best villain. No. The true villain of this movie was Amanda Waller. I'm going to get into her a bit more later. Amanda Waller was a revelation. A 
bad ass, a complete maniac, scary, terrifying villain. Every moment she was on screen, her presence was exciting, thrilling. I didn't know what she was going to do. Many people I speak to um, about this movie, they hate her. Like, they were like, oh, I couldn't stand her, couldn't stand her. And I'm like, but, but you thought she was good? Oh yeah, she was really, really good, really menacing. I just, it's like, she was just so fucking evil. I just couldn't even stand her, like when she came on screen. That's how good she was. She was one of those villains you don't even like. I liked her because I just thought she was a badass. But anyway, she is the true villain of the piece. Much better villain than Enchantress. Uh, much better villain than the Joker in this movie. Just a fantastic, um, fantastic villain. Um, so, if you're talking about Suicide Squad lacking a villain, I'm sorry, not 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 good enough. Really had one of the best villains, um, not in cinematic history, but definitely in comic book history. She blows. And by, by the way, Enchantress. And Amanda Waller, I will put up against any Marvel villain to date. And that is not a compliment to um, Amanda Waller and Enchantress. That is a critique of the, of, of the, of the trash that we have come to see um, as Marvel villains. Absolutely atrocious. You have no right as a critic to talk about any DC villain. Whether it's Lex Luthor from um, uh, from the uh, Superman, sorry, Lex Luthor from uh, Ma uh, Batman v Superman, you know what? Hell, I don't even. I hate Man of Steel. Hate Man of Steel. Even Zod is more memorable. I, and I hated Zod. Is more memorable than than pretty much any Marvel villain to date. So please get off your high horse if you're like saying you love. Um, Marvel, and then you're dissing uh, uh, the, the villain of the DC movie, Enchantress. That is nuts. Here's another one. I, I, this is more of a fanboy one. This isn't something that the critics have said. This is amazing. I love this one. The villain is too powerful. <laughs> Enchantress is too powerful. She's too OP, man. Too OP, bro. Why, like, these guys aren't even meta-humans. <laughs> and she's too OP. How do they even take her down? Alright. Um, well, alright. So you can see I've been fair. Like, the Joker, the editing fucked up the Joker, messed up the Joker a little bit. So you can see I've been fair. Alright. So, the movie is called Suicide Squad. These people, the whole concept of the movie is these are bad guys who are going on a mission that they're likely not going to be able to survive from. It's so dangerous that it is suicide to go into the mission. How can you possibly say, as a criticism of a movie called Suicide Squad, that the villain is too OP? <laughs> it's too, she's too powerful for the Suicide Squad because they're not. And then they say, well, you know, like, and, and the whole thing of the movie is like, oh, you know, well, the, the whole premise is like, what if Superman were to, um, you know, uh, take down the White House or something like that? Um, who would stop him? And Amanda Waller says, you know, this is this Suicide Squad will stop him. And um, you know, everyone's like, well, how are these Suicide Squad? You know, Deadshot can't stop him. Well, if Deadshot could probably stop him with a kryptonite bullet because he's quite good. He's quite handy with those. Uh, with those old guns, isn't he? Um, but, uh, you know, Harley Quinn, well, she, she's just crazy. Uh, Diablo, well, you found out what he could do later, but could that take Superman down? I'm not sure. Maybe oh, maybe could give him a little bit of an interesting fight. You never know. 
Um, but generally speaking, yeah, El Diablo on 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 a on a bad on his bad day on or sorry on a on a normal day shouldn't be able shouldn't be a problem for Superman. Uh, and you can run down the line, Killer Croc, etc., etc., etc. However, the fact is, all Amanda Waller Amanda Waller said is like she's looking for these metahumans. And the second thing is, if you take um, if you take the Enchantress into account, then Actually, you do have someone who could take on Superman. You saw what she could do. She could do amazing, amazing things, amazing feats. We know Superman, um, his weakness is magic. So, essentially, the Suicide Squad could be a problem for Superman. What if uh, Enchantress got into his head and made him see all these um, weird fantasies? But I will give the critics one thing on this, and I haven't heard many of them mention this, but I thought this was absolutely stupid. Um, and I thought the, the writing could have been a lot better here. Amanda Waller was a complete badass, as I said. But why? <laughs> why did she have the Enchantress's heart right next to her and, and her thing was to hurt it with a pencil? I thought that was a bit silly. It didn't take me out of the movie. I still thought the movie was fun. Is a minor gripe. It was, and I'm going to go into something of the style of the movie and why some of these kind of silly, dumb things actually made a little bit of sense. But like that was pretty dumb. You know, you would have thought she had the heart in some kind of connected to some bomb somewhere that if you know the enchantress goes near it or she's got a magic, field, you know, something like that where you know. She, She'd be pretty. It would be pretty hard for the enchantress to get at the heart, but for it to be right in front of her, that kind of defied belief. Although you could see it as maybe like a magic lantern or something. Maybe if they explain that a little bit, like the heart is like a magic lantern. Like generally, if you have possession of it, you have control of the enchantress, right? So it could have worked like that. But anyway, that was a bit of a stupid part of the movie. Um, same with her. You know, she's standing in front of a guy who's you know, supposed to be really, really quick with guns and shoot people. And she's got, got the phone in front of her hand, which she can use to blow off people's heads. Seemed a bit far-fetched. I think Deadshot would be able to get her before she'd be able to get the phone. So um, there should have been some explanation on that. Generally, these are nitpicks. It's a, it's, it's a comic book. Just try, like, enjoy Okay, if you can enjoy, enjoy. If you if it's if that really is so frustrating for you, the two points I just mentioned, which I can kind of understand, then I understand. But in general, just try and enjoy. Stop being a film critic. Stop trying to be a film critic. You just just sit down and enjoy a movie, unless it's so bad, like Independence Day Resurgence, that it's impossible to enjoy. Okay. The soundtrack wasn't good. Why? Uh, I'm not even going to, uh, you know, uh, dignify that with an answer. I mean, the soundtrack wasn't good. It was distracting. What is that? Could you hear the people's voices over the music? And they say, they say, oh, it was all the way through just music popping up random. No, it wasn't. The music was p completely appropriate for each of the characters involved when it was Harley Quinn. It was appropriate for Harley Quinn, the music that came on. When it was, um, you know, uh, Deadshot, it was appropriate for him, the music that came on. When it was Amanda Waller, it was perfect for her, and, and so on. So there you go. I, I'm not even going to dignify that with an answer, the soundtrack. And by the way, the soundtrack was pretty epic by the end. By the end of the movie, when it was coming to the third act, the climax, you know, pretty much after those introductions in the beginning, um, those little vignettes uh, introducing each of the characters. The soundtrack after that was basically, um, you know, your classic movie soundtrack. So I have no idea what people are talking about. With that. Um, misogynistic depiction of Harley. The misogynistic depiction of Harley Quinn. Uh, next, next subject. The misogynistic. Here's one where... I kind of agree with the critics on this. This is um, something I felt was distracting in the movie. It wasn't, again, it wasn't so distracting that I wasn't able to see the fun in the movie, but I didn't like it. 
And I also thought it was disrespectful to um, Margot Robbie's performance as Harley Quinn. The over, over sexualized, I mean, those shorts were just, you know, and, and Margot Robbie looks pretty attractive in any, like, you know, I, I, I don't know what she could have worn that would be different, but it just was, it was so much. I mean, I thought um, Margot Robbie, which I'll talk about later when I talk about the five things I really liked about the movie. I think Margot Robbie did such a nuanced performance as, and she was one of my favourite, favourite things in the whole movie. Um, I think she knocked it out of the park. I think most people agree she knocked it out of the park. And um, the sexualization of her, um, I, I thought was distasteful in some ways. I didn't mind her being sexualized to the extent of, you know, say how Nolan or, um, uh, you know, uh, say how um, Tim Burton kind of sexualized Catwoman. But it was sexualized in a way where she was using her sexuality, anything where it was, uh, you know, where she was kind of sexualized, it was always her using her sexuality as a kind of weapon. It was her taking her female sexuality, which is a part of women, and, and, and um, using it as, as a power, um, so that, you know, to overcome either victimhood or to just use as a kind of power in general um, against, uh, you know, a variety of different kind of opponents um, in a kind of manipulative uh, um, or strategic kind of math, uh, manner. So with Harley Quinn, I didn't feel that was the case. I felt sometimes they just kind of lingered over her body for no apparent reason. Um, a misogynistic uh, depiction of Harley Quinn, I kind of agree with, with the critics. But here's what I am going to say in defense of the movie and how it treated female characters. This movie, and this is one of the things I'm going to, I'm not going to go into too much about this because I'm going to talk about this later. This movie has a very, very diverse use of women. So in some ways you can um, the, uh, uh, justify Harley Quinn's hypersexualization in this movie because there are other women, you know, that show that not, you know, the, 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 the other women aren't, you know, well, they're not, they're not sexual, you know, sexually kind of depicted. So it's like Harley Quinn's sexuality is part of her character, so she can be a sexual, so you can be a sexual woman, but it shows that not all women are just, or are, are sexual. Um, in that way, or sexually provocative in that way. Some women are like Amanda Waller. He wasn't, he wasn't sexualized at all. And was very, very kind of, you know. And then it had another uh, woman in, in, in June Moon who kind of played, played three, where Enchantress, you could say, was a bit like sexualized herself. But June Moon wasn't very sexualized, um, I don't think. Um, so you had another kind of main character. So there was very, three very diverse, strong central characters in the movie who were who were females and i i tell me a, a a marvel movie where that's happened or or a comic movie i can't think of one you know um and, and that that's you're not even counting katana who uh, is an asian uh, you know female so we'll get into that later so the misogynistic depiction of harley quinn i think is a fair argument Uh, too many characters. Uh, I'm, again, this one um, is something that is said. Uh, the characters weren't developed enough, etc., etc. What did you want? You know, the, the, they keep saying like Marvel. They're trying to catch up with Marvel. They're doing everything too fast. So this is the too many characters. I'll put up the titles um, in the video so you can see um, the too many characters argument. <clears throat> now, what, what do you want them to do? I mean, you say that they're trying to play catch up. This is what you always hear, you know, um, that uh, the, 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 um, the Marvel comics earned it, they did individual movies, so you could understand. So what did you want? I mean, you wanted the Suicide Squad, you wanted them to have individual movies before doing the Suicide Squad movie. <laughs> I don't understand what you wanted. Do you not think 
that in later movies they might be able to explore characters like Katana, like the secondary characters that you thought were interesting. And, you know, you might do the, oh, the show don't tell her kind of argument. Oh, they just said that her sword at the souls of people. You didn't get to see it. It's, 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 it's a couple of seconds of the movie, first of all. Okay. Um, yeah, it's probably not the best way to kind of introduce um, a, a character's abilities or skills. You know, someone just say it kind of on the nose like that. But, I mean, that was part of the kind of beak B-movie quality homage of the movie that it had anyway. But let me put it this way. Um, there's plenty of time in sequels to explore characters like Katana. Um, you know, I remember like uh, Dan, um, and it, it was maddening. It was like, it was completely maddening. They did a show on um, Screen Junkies where they were, uh, you know, the movie fights. I don't know if you guys watch it. I watch it sometimes. And they did one on Suicide Squad. And, uh, you know, Dan is one of the fighters who's, like, supposedly a champion. Um, I'd love to go on the show and take him on. He'd probably win, I don't know. But um, he said, you know, the Joker wasn't important to the movie. And if you take the Joker out of the movie, it would be the same thing. Um, it would be the same movie. And, you know, you just didn't need him in there because you could tell Harley Quinn was crazy and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And to me, that was the equivalent of saying Deadshot's daughter wasn't needed in the movie. You know, there's too many characters. Why didn't they take Deadshot's daughter out of the movie? It would have been the same movie. Um, because the Joker was there to inform Harley Quinn's character. So you could see the background of how she became Harley Quinn. Okay, that was what he was there, that's what he served to do in the movie. With Deadshot, it was his daughter that served to do that in the movie. So no one, I don't hear anyone saying Deadshot's daughter shouldn't have been in the movie. But because it's the Joker, it's like, oh, well, you know, like, if he isn't going to do something like, you know, like, be the best thing in the whole film, then he shouldn't be in the film. Uh, there are plenty of cool DC characters, okay? The Joker doesn't always have to be the highlight of every single movie he's in. That's what DC has done, and this is where DC's to blame, because DC should have introduced so many of these characters in better ways a long time ago, so that people would be excited when, um, you know, uh, they hear, oh, you know, uh, Amanda Waller's in a new movie, and because Amanda Waller, I, I, I can't wait to see who they're going to get to cast as Amanda Waller, you know, or, because um, she's a great character in the comics, you know, so people could have been as excited to see her or, uh, you know, to see, uh, you know, a number of these different characters. All right, maybe not like Deadshot and all of these kind of guys, but you know, like in the end, what I'm saying is, um, Joker doesn't always have to be the highlight of every movie he's in. It doesn't mean the movie's bad because Joker wasn't the best thing in it. Okay, he just happened to not not be the best thing in this movie. Harley Quinn was better than him. Deadshot was better than him, and uh, and so was uh, Amanda Waller, uh, and um, you know, that that that's just the way it is. This is a, a critique. The, the film has no plot. Okay, I... I, I has no plot. <laughs> so the film has no plot. That's, that's an argument here. And there are movies that are more character-driven. It's more about having a fun character. And this is why I compare this movie. Uh, I say this is... this. To me, Suicide Squad is like a modern-day, lesser Big Trouble in Little China. Because what Big Trouble in Little China is, is a movie with a kind of thin, hokey, crazy plot, which back in the day, when it first came out, critics kind of panned. They disliked the movie um, a lot, Big Trouble in Little China. But the movie, because and they were like, oh, the plot's thin, and the villain's this, and, you know, the, the, the other characters aren't very developed. But the, the movie wasn't about that. The movie was about, um, you know, uh, uh, Jack. <laughs> I 
Um, I can't even remember his surname. He's a fuck. He's one of my favourite characters in movie history. I should remember his surname. It's really bad. But the movie was about him and just following him, doing his crazy stuff, going through some crazy uh, plot in Chinatown. It hardly made any sense, and demons and ghosts were coming out of the woodworks where, you know, it was just about him and his re reactions to all the crazy stuff because he was such a fun character that it didn't matter. It almost, he was almost plot-proof as a character because he was so fun with his lines and the way he was responding to to, 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 to the situations which were so outlandish. You know, he was the guy who was saying what we were thinking as an audience as you were going through the movie, and we loved him for it. Um, so that is that is essentially what Suicide Squad is. It's, it's a bunch of fun characters who are going on um, an adventure, and because they're so fun, it hardly matters what that adventure is because you just want to be one of the squad. You just want to be with them on this adventure. So when the third act isn't, doesn't you know, live up to the standards that you expect of you know, an epic third act or something like that, you have to remember it, it wasn't about like, the plot. It was just about those characters and where they were going and the fact that you cared if they were able to succeed and if they were able to finally defeat the, the monster at the end of the movie and each one of them could resolve um, the uh, the arcs um, that they had at the beginning of the movie and that go leads me on to the next point which is you know the, the people are like the, the, the there were no story arcs for the characters and at first I you know I started thinking you know when I first heard this I was like is that true because I was like yeah maybe 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 I was so lost in how fun these characters were that I didn't realise that they didn't really have um, these story arcs. And I thought, maybe, maybe, maybe they're right. And then I started thinking, wait a second. What about, what about old Diablo? That guy had a really cool, like, I, I mean, I genuinely cared about, like, he started off where he didn't want to fight. Um, you find out, you know, in, he finally kind of is, um, you know, by the Deadshot character, kind of leader character is, is, um, uh, you know, uh, made to kind of use um, his powers, his abilities, finally, um, and 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 see that they can be used for good, even though he thinks they're just a curse and can only be used for destruction. And he finally sees that he can use it to save his family and his friends. Um, and then you finally find out why he didn't want to use his powers. And then even further than that, you find out, you know, that he's he, he, by in, you know, because there's the, a really good bit where Harley Quinn says, you know, embrace that, embrace what you did. Don't don't be a a chicken, you know, and a chicken shit, or whatever, and 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 and, uh, and a coward, and not uh, and and sit there feeling sorry for yourself. And what happens when he um, is able to embrace that? He's able to see past um, the witch's dream that she plants in his head and then she's he's also able to fully embrace his power um by embracing that you know he was he did do this and there is no way back you know there there's he can't live in some dream world that she creates where you know his family still exists he has to embrace the fact that he has not he has done this terrible, terrible thing, and only by embracing that can he fully embrace his power and use it finally for good. So, El Diablo, great character, great story arc. I mean, I didn't really like him so much as a character, but I loved his story arc, and I, I, I liked the heart, and he was played well, he was played good. You know, I think a lot of other characters had some better lines, maybe, you know, but he was a good character, a nice little part of the um, Suicide Squad. Um, Harley Quinn definitely had a story arc. I mean, like, um, I'm not going to go into it too much, but like, yeah, she had a, there was a beginning, a middle and an end where, you know, she kind of, um, she, it's almost like, but, but Harley Quinn and Deadshot had very, very similar. It was them having to overcome, you know, the fatal flaw that made them these kind of tragic, like, like not tragic heroes, but yeah, well, in a way, tragic heroes. It, 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 they were tragic heroes, not on the kind of 
in the Shakespearean sense, but they do have, they both shared the, 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 the fatal flaw um, that you often find with a tragic hero um, that, uh, you know, that they had to, um, that, that was either going to kind of uh, destroy them or that was either going to um, be something that they had to overcome or something that they had to confront to be able to finally um, uh, um, take on and destroy uh, the monster at the end, essentially. That, that, that's what it was. I mean, if Harley Quinn couldn't, um, you know, um, get over her kind of, what had driven her crazy, what had made her into this insane person, um, and if she couldn't confront that, then she wouldn't have been able to defeat the, the, this woman because she was willing to say, oh, hey, you know, Joker's just died, but this woman's saying she can almost give her back the Joker. And she's, she had to overcome, finally, that complete obsession that had driven her mad of her love for the Joker to be able to defeat the monster and, and kill her with the sword. Deadshot, very similar with the daughter. If you didn't have all that build up with the daughter, um, that bit where, you know, you know, it was the first time, you know, he wasn't willing to shoot Batman because if he shot Batman, you know, then um, he, he could have, you know, in front of his daughter, she would have seen how, who he was and he didn't want her to see that side of himself. Um, but now she's standing in front of him and he has to kill the Enchantress, who's a real bad guy, who's going to destroy the world if he doesn't do this. And finally, he, 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 he overcomes that, you know, internal uh, um, emotional... That, that, that emotional anchor he has in the beginning to be able to um, destroy the monster. Again, how do these characters not have story arcs? S some of them don't because they're not needed. They're just there as secondary, really, really secondary characters, you know? Like, what story arc do the characters in Predator have apart from... I don't even think Arnold Schwarzenegger himself has a story arc in that movie. The main character, I don't, he goes to a jungle. I don't know if there's any specific emotional kind of thing that he's connected to in his past. I think it's just a bunch of badasses who go to a jungle and uh, confront some kind of monstrous creature which they uh, have to overcome and kill. I don't, I don't think any of them have a story arc. They're just badass and cool and we like watching them and we like to, and, and, and because we care about them because they're so cool, it makes us care about how um, each of them are, are getting killed off by this alien. That, that, that's it. You know, so again, what this proves is even the notion that a movie's character needs a story arc for it to be really, really good, like each character needs their own arc, that's false. It's patently false. Now, would I say the most movies, is it sensible to at least try, if you're a movie maker, to um, have your character have some kind of story arc like that? Because the most likelihood is if they don't, the film isn't going to be that good. I would absolutely agree with that. Absolutely agree. However, um, however, having said uh, all of that... Um, it is still not a rule. It is just um, something that is highly recommended in storytelling. It's not a rule, just highly, highly, highly recommended that you add that kind of story arc. Because there are no rules to storytelling. There are no really, really strict... I mean, apart from um, if you have to... You know, I mean, like, there, there, there just isn't that kind of rule um, to, to uh, film storytelling. It, it, it doesn't have that. Um, so the, the story arc thing, 
I mean, obviously, I mean, when I say story arc, you have to understand what I mean by story arc. It's like a character arc. Obviously, there has to be a story arc. There has to be a beginning, a middle, and the end of the story, right? Um, and even that's not necessarily true. But like generally speaking, there has to be a beginning, middle, uh, and the end of a story. And the character's actions have to be the things that, um, you know, uh, uh, are the things that um, move on that that move on the um, move on that story from the beginning to the middle to the end. However, the character arcs, which I'm sorry, this is what I was talking about, character arcs, I'll put a thing on top so that you know what I'm talking about during this section. When I say story arc, I actually meant character arc. So, um, the character arcs, highly, highly sensible that you try and give your characters character arcs because it makes people invested in the character. However, do you have to have a character arc for a film to be successful and enjoyable for all of the characters? No. And thirdly, and most importantly, all the main characters in this movie do have character arcs. So either way you look at it, there's the June Moon one as well. I'm not going to go into that one, but there's the June Moon and um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the kind of Captain America soldier guy um, who uh, is dating her. There's his story arc as well with her. So all of them have a story arc. His, his story arc is actually quite good because he's like, he, he disrespects Deadshot. Um, you know, and he's like convinced, he almost dehumanizes like them, as, uh, these kind of prisoners as just kind of scum. And he thinks he's completely noble and different and a good guy. And over the course of the movie, he realizes actually this kind of law enforcement and what we do on the legal side of things isn't so far from what uh, from these bad guys and in fact Amanda Waller is probably more insane uh, <laughs> than any of the guys of the team in terms of villainy um, and you know you see that moment in the end of the movie where he gives uh, Deadshot a little bit more time with his daughter because he's finally learnt to respect these kind of criminals as not just criminals they're just human beings like him or they're just people like him. So uh, we're, we're almost at the home run now. So there's, there's 10 things and we're on number 10. Um, oh, so characters didn't get enough time to develop. Again, I think I've covered this essentially like with the no uh, character arcs um, part of this, uh, uh, part of this video. So, no character arcs. Um, effectively, uh, so, sorry, the characters didn't get enough time to develop. I, I say poppycock. Uh, I, I thought every character, like the one they love to throw throw at us, um, uh, people who actually enjoy um, Suicide Squad. This is the one they love to throw at us. They love to throw Slipknot. Who gives a crap about Slipknot and his death? No one cares. I didn't care. I wanted him to die. I didn't want to know anything about him. I wanted him to die as quickly as possible. I thought it was funny. I like. I even liked the killer app line. It was a bit, you know, I didn't see, it wasn't obvious actually, um, but you know, the killer app line that um, Harley Quinn lit uses after he get. I, I, I found it was funny that Slipknot died like that. I, I, I kind of laughed a bit. I've got a sick sense of humor. I'm a sick, sick man. There's something wrong with me. Uh, I just like the fact that Slipknot died in that way. It was kind of sexual. But uh, no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> Slipknot dies. And uh, it, it, it's fine. He was one of my favourite characters for it. Um, so I, I didn't need he, him to be developed for me, the guy who's going to die to prove to the Suicide Squad that the neck bombs were real. And I'm going to put spoiler alert at the beginning of this movie. Because that's a huge spoiler that I just gave you. But I'm going to put spoiler alert. I assume all of you have watched the film. So I'm going to put spoiler alert in the description if you haven't watched the film. Uh, and the last thing um, I'm going to put... This is, again, more of a fanboy criticism than, um, than it is uh, what the critics uh, said. They said the... 
Joker and Harley Quinn's relationship was not accurate to the comics. And also, sorry, um, this is just an aside. This is just 10B. Um, Joke and Harley Quinn's relationship wasn't accurate to the comics. And the villains weren't bad enough in this movie because we were sold, apparently, on the fact that um, the Suicide Squad was a bunch of villains and the villains weren't bad enough. People didn't believe these guys were really villainous. Wow. Okay, so Joker and Harley Quinn's relationship wasn't accurate. I think I kind of um, covered that in the fact that if they did make it comic accurate, whereas to try and translate what was in the animated <laughs> show, um, but try and trans translate it for kind of PG-13 audi film audience to make it make sense to them, it would, have been a, it would have been disturbing because essentially the Joker and Harley Quinn's relationship was uh, one of a domestic abuse relationship. I don't think... Um, I don't think film audiences are necessarily ready to see the Joker in that light because people like the Joker. He's one of those villains that people like. So having him, you know, just blatant, like even when I see it in the, um, you know, in the computer games or in the, co in the comics, I'm kind of like, ah, oh, it kind of like, it weirds me out a bit because I'm like, ah, oh, man, I like the Joker. I like that he's sick and twisted and does all these crazy things. But when he just beats up women, it's something I disre disrespect so much in my own personal uh, kind of life that you're you're just like, that's kind of cold, dude. <laughs> like, he just slapped her straight in the face like she was nothing. And she's just cowering away like, you know, this little, you know, hurt little mouse. And it, it, it's just, I think that given um, the response, although I would have loved to see this covered in the movie, but given the response to Batman v Superman, we have no one to blame but ourselves that the Joker and Harley Quinn's relationship was not dealt with in that kind of manner because, you, you, as I said, first of all, it would have been very uncomfortable to see. It would have added a dimension to the Joker that I think would be very, very interesting. And maybe it could be covered in later movies because it would be cool to kind of have a Joker that, even though you kind of still kind of find funny and you like in this kind of sick way, that there is something definite about him that you really do think, well, that, you know, there's, there's nothing cool about this he, this is just straight up villainous you know everything he did in the dark knight was kind of cool he was this cool bank robber anarchist there was nothing he did that you didn't find kind of cool you know everyone he was manipulating kind of was an asshole <laughs> you know? everyone he was killing or tampering with were kind of assholes so you know when he kills the gangster you're like that's awesome you know Joke is one of those villains that 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 you, that you you kind of like, even though you know Batman has to stop this guy. You kind of just you find it fun that he what he's doing the whole way through. So it would be kind of interesting to have a Joker where there's a dimension of him where you're like, wow, I really don't like that bit of that that bit of the Joker. Really makes me uncomfortable that he just like beats up women like that. But you couldn't do that because they couldn't go there. Because if they went there, this, the, the backlash, um, because people would have been, oh, it's too dark, and the violence towards women, and, oh, Harley Quinn's already so sexualized, now she's like a bad, sexualized, hypersexualized sex object. It, it would have been crazy, the backlash, I, and, and people wouldn't have liked the Joker, and it would have been crazy, because people are very passionate about the Joker. I'm not. I like to see interesting, crazy things done with characters, these established characters, and taking new angles on them but I, I don't think it would have flown I think it would have hurt the movie if if he was just this violent against uh, Harley Quinn um, so yeah uh, those are me breaking down basically why I think um, Suicide Squad was a um, all the criticisms against it are overzealous bombastic um, I want to take like just a little bit of time to just read a couple of the, the, the criticisms. So, let me take this one. 
Writer-direct David doesn't have the right graphic technique for a comic book style uh, jamboree. He's strictly a noirish pulp guy, and the characters all whom are promisingly... No, that's not so bad. Okay, so th this one, uh, Suicide Squad's an absolute waste of time. Well, I I've, I'm going to maybe read this because let me see something because I want to just give some kind of example um, oh, it's all in Spanish great Wow, this one is this one's amazing. This one you're gonna love this. This is from Rotten Tomatoes. This is the, the kind of critiques everyone this makes up. This review makes up twenty seven percent. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what, what, what it says just straight off the bat. An over caffeinated, underwhelming succession of skirmishes and squabbles with plot borrowed from X Men a pocket. Apocalypse and lessons not learned from Batman and Robin. I, was the person drunk when they wrote that? I, I, I like. C can anyone, even somebody who doesn't like the movie, can you tell me how that makes any sense? So Kiwi audiences could have um, could have cause for complaint under the Consumer Guarantees Act with this one. Uh, many a comic book movie fanboy and girl would have um, been salivating at the prospect of what promised to be an uh, anarchic gleeful antidote to the sullen ball fest that was Dawn of Justice. T little thing to take a shot at Dawn of Justice. However, those sli slick and slinky trailers that so thrilled blah blah blah, overselling Jared Letter's presence and hiding its clearly ropey villains, the pre-publicity desperate, uh, desperately wanted to believe uh, it was finally DC's answer to Guardians of the Galaxies and the Avengers. Instead, we've been given two hours of what is all sizzle and no substance with um, best the best 15 minutes, the initial character introductions, all backed by uh, classic cuts from parent company Warner's back catalogue. Yeah, I mean, this... Th 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 <laughs> I, I don't even know what to say about this. So picking up the pieces of the aftermath of justice, this is Viola Davis's Nick Fury as government official assembling the worst of the worst in preparation for next metahumans, um, who unlike Superman might not share our values. Naturally, she's um, already got one in mind, the Enchantress. What follows is an over caffeinated, underwhelming succession of skirmishes and squabbles. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually put this up so that you can see this because this is beautiful. Uh, this is exactly what I'm talking about, and this is where I'm saying, like, you know, the fact that these scores influence, um, you know, people's opinions and whether they go and see these movies is crazy. How can you say this as a critique? This is nothing that's been said in this um, in this uh, um, critique of the film is is um, is it, it doesn't have any meaning. None of it has any meaning. It's just um, associations with bad things. That's what he's done. He's so, so what 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 follows is an over caffeinated, underwhelming succession of skirmishes. Is that true? Where where are all these skirmishes that you see? There was. Uh, there's action scenes, yeah, sure, but, but not, not all of it is skirmishes and squabbles, with um, a large chunks of plot borrowed from X-Men Apocalypse. This is an actual reviewer, an actual reviewer on Rotten Tomatoes. How could they possibly have borrowed from X-Men Apocalypse, another film that's underrated, by the way, how could they possibly have um, borrowed from X-Men Apocalypse. The films came out like roughly like 
X-Men Apocalypse came out, like, was it a month before Suicide Squad? How, 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 how could it have done that? With, uh, with chunks of plot borrowed from X-Men Apocalypse. I don't know if he means that they were similar. I, I, I don't know what he means. And a Baz Luhrmann-esque love story and lessons not learned from Batman and Robin. That's, that's your critique. Uh, that so many of the people on comic book movie that, you know, some DC fans are arguing with. Now, do I think it's overzealous for them to go off and start, um, you know, doing petitions and all of this kind of stuff. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a bit overzealous, but but when you see something like that, when you see a critique like that on Rotten Tomatoes, it's disheartening that someone is allowed to be a professional critic and do such a terrible terrible job. That doesn't even make any sense at all. Um so I'm going to I'm going to have that um put up uh so that everyone can kind of see that um wow that film review it, that i didn't even think it was going to be that bad i really didn't i thought they were going to say stuff like oh it's too dark it's too that 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 blew my mind uh I w so anyway let me move on to the last bit of the video uh, I'll, I'll put some links in the bottom to some of the the, the Generic and poorly executed, you can't help feel sorry for the filmmakers. What is that? What does that mean? Um, you know, whatever. I, I mean, I just think, are these people thinking about, take yourself out of this, the equation, your personal opinion, because so much of it this, these days, it's all about, oh, it's our personal opinion. Take yourself out of um, the equation and just think for a moment, Will people who like this sort of movie enjoy the movie? And if the answer is yes, you have to give it a certain score. Then, as a critic, you can start talking about your own personal feelings towards it. And maybe the genre. Or maybe just do a piece on the genre. And don't, don't, don't do a critique of the, or reviews of the individual movies if you just don't like the genre. No lessons from Batman and Robin, wow. Um, so uh, I'm just going to quickly go through this. So these are the five things that I would say are um, set this out um, and not only make it a movie that, as I said, whether you think it's a great movie, a mediocre movie or a bad movie, these are five reasons why I think the movie has one value. And then secondly, above and beyond that, which is even more important, that it's like, you know... If, if you see a kid, right, like, um, who's doing... Because that, that's what reviewers are. They're, they're, they're essentially giving uh, an exam score, right, to a kid. Uh, or to, they're doing, giving exam scores to um, the filmmakers. Okay, now, if you get an essay and you think, wow, you know, the, this person's done some... It's not really good, the spelling's off, and some other things that, that, that bring it down on a technical level, the essay itself, right? But you can see there's a lot of creativity and imagination involved somewhere in that kind of, in the essay. So like there's some good ideas, but it has to be honed and you have to get them to, 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 to be able to, um, you know, hone and put, you wouldn't just start going to the kid, this is terrible, this is horrible, you know, this is the worst book report I've ever seen. Just taking complete glee and delight in, in destroying the kid who's done this um, creative exam, even though the spelling's off and the grammar's a bit off and all of this kind of stuff. What you do is you do some constructive criticism, well, you've got to work on your grammar here. Your grammar's very off, here's what you do, you know, um, here's how you use the articles, here's how you, you know, and then, uh, you know, as far as um, the spelling, you know, you don't you remember the E before, <laughs> whatever it is, but you still have to say, hey, but this is the really, really good stuff about this. And I think so much is dismissing the good stuff. So many of these reviews don't even seem to be wanting to um, acknowledge that the Suicide Squad 
has some really, really interesting um, filmmaking in it. You know, it, like what it's attempted to do, um, even if it, even if you believe it isn't, um, it doesn't pull it off. It was noble in and of itself to try it as a filmmaker to do. And I'm going to say the same thing of Batman v Superman. And this is where I would take um, the Marvel movies down because I think Marvel movies are the ones that, you know, they, they, they have the perfect grammar, they have the perfect spelling, and the, 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 you know, the structure of the essay is very, very nice. But essentially everything that's being sent in it is bland and regurgitated and they heard it from somewhere else, you know, they have no ideas of their own and, you know, that, that's what I would call your average art Marvel movie, it's a C plus. You know, all of them are C plus. So um, now I'm going to say, for instance, <clears throat> um, the characters and acting, fantastic. That is something that you have to respect about this movie. Harley Quinn, fantastic. Deadshot, fantastic. Uh, the comedy relief I've talked about with um, Ike Byrne, uh, uh, Baron Holtz, fantastic as Grits, the, 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 the uh, guard at Bell Rev. Um, so many funny moments, so many funny bits between him and Deadshot. Um, when he says, uh, you know, like he's giving um, Harley Quinn her medicine, and he's like taking photos saying spring break. Uh, hilarious. Uh, everyone was laughing when I was at the cinema when he did that. Um, Captain Boomerang, another really funny. I mean, maybe you can say uh, a bit of an Aussie stereotype, but whatever, man. I thought he was funny as hell. Uh, and every time he was doing something, I heard audiences laughing. Um, and that's why I think, you know, this film's got repeat viewing. The characters are just so fun, you know. Uh, um, uh, as I said, Amanda Waller, uh, we'll get on to her. Heart, the heart of the movie, El Diablo. Great, great, uh, you know, um, great cast, great, great acting. Um, I hope I haven't missed anyone who was good. Uh, now, here's one, one thing that I think is highly undervalued about this movie, and I don't even see many uh, critics saying this. And you'd think they would. You'd, you'd think in this PC era that they would talk about this, that they would say this. This was one of the most multicultural, diverse casts with powerful women and characterizations of um, women um, where the women were the, 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 the women were the badasses. The, the women were the best characters. It was Harley Quinn, um, uh, and you know, I I thought the, the Enchantress was very good, but some people, obviously, a lot of people don't. But you, you can't deny Harley Quinn, and you cannot deny an, uh, Amanda Waller. I thought they were fantastic. Um, and then the multicultural diversity of the cast, the the the, the, the Asian lead. You know, when you see Asians in in, in bloody Marvel movies. It's taken them a whole, their whole first, um, you know, Black Widow hasn't had a movie, although I don't think she deserves one, because I don't think she's that interesting. Uh, but anyway, Marvel does uh, films about uninteresting characters all the time, so why not give Black Widow one? It's, it's not that I'm saying, like, you know, she doesn't deserve it over um, anyone else, but I, I think she's as interesting to me as Thor. I, I don't find Thor that interesting. I, I might want to see um, a, a Black Widow movie over a, a next Thor movie, for instance. So I think she deserved the movie over her. So when has Marvel... It's, it's taken them a whole phase one before they even started making movies with, like, where are the powerful women? The women are so generic. I don't care what anyone says. I don't think... Black Widow is that interesting. I don't think she was great in the event. Nothing she's ever done has made that what what they call character development um essentially in Marvel for me is is good one liners. You know, if she's got good one liners, oh that was great character development and the critics are like, oh what great character development. She had good one liners. No. It's not like that. Um so in terms of the diversity of the cast, multicultural, um, again, you know, how long did it take them to get Black Panther onto the Avengers team? How long did it get? They don't even have an Asian. They don't even have an Asian. You know, um, the 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 the, the, um, uh, the um, what's her name, Scarlet Witch. Not really that interesting, is she? Let's face it. 
she's not like a powerful badass woman that you know like other women will like I'll, I'll give them that she's not being hypersexualized great but that's that's about the only thing i can say um in favor of um how marvel have uh, treated their women N no one of color any anyone um who is ethnic um is black first of all there's no other you know kind of uh, maybe the cast was a little bit more diverse in ant-man which i kind of liked um although the, the <laughs> forget about it um so uh, the multicultural um cast is very very lacking in um, the marvel movies um when you do have a um a, a kind of character who is um one of the heroes in the uh in, in one of the marvel movies that is that is black there's no other other race as i said but that is black um, what are they? I mean, it's it's always the same kind of thing. They're the sidekicks. They're the you know they're the secondary characters of one of the main um, cast, and they're not really like a big part of the Avengers. Let's face it, you know, um, they're not. You know, they're not. They're just not. You know, um, so uh, you know. I, I won't go into the example, I can't even remember the names, like the, um, there's Iron Man's sidekick, played by Don Cheadle. Don Cheadle is too good for that role, way too good for that role. Um, and then the other one, um, which is played by Anthony Mackie, again, great actor, could do be doing so much more. Um, they've, they're wasting him as some weird hawk flying basically he's flying captain america he's flying sassy black captain america that's basically what he is another series of one-liners um so there you go uh and black panther i'll go on to him later when i'm talking about um uh this uh, captain america civil war um as for um as for uh the rest of it let me shoot through this really quickly because i want to get over this this particular video so um the uh, the next thing i would say that this movie does well i don't know exactly what i'm going to title this i guess just cinematography um and soundtrack maybe this is a, a colorful beautifully shot young vibrant hip movie as i said with the multicultural cast gives it that flavor of eclectic eclecticism and 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 and, 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 and it's sexy and it do you know what i mean it's colorful and, and and vibrant and young you know and i think eventually this movie is gonna it's it's gonna go down as a cult classic it really does remind me of and i'm not saying it's as good as big trouble in little china but it does remind me of that fun kind of energetic, um, a lively vibe of Big Trouble in Little China. Um, and I think uh, when kids watch this at Christmas, you know, as they're growing up, that's going to be what this is for them. You know, that, 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 that weird, quirky kind of film from, you know, the way I look at films from the 90s and 80s, it's like those weird, quirky films with the people with the bizarre hair and they were like, just, just guys you wanted to be like, you know, when you grow up because they were just so awesome. They were always just doing awesome things, you know, dead shots just being awesome. And all of these people are being awesome. And that's how I think, you know, like that's what the characters in Big Trouble in Little China were doing, you know, like the, the, the little Chinaman who was like, could do all the martial arts, you know, I liked him. I wanted to be like him. I obviously wanted to be like uh, Jack, you know, because he was just a badass himself and he was just always doing things, saying awesome shit. Um, so uh, that, that's, that's how I think this is going to go down as the movie. I think it's going to take a couple of years once people have moved past the fact that um, they can get over the fact that the Joker wasn't the main villain, the Joker wasn't in it as, in it as much as they want. Um, they, they, they get over their entitled, their, their feeling of entitlement, you know, like, oh, I'm going to sue the studio because the Joker wasn't in it enough. Um, once they get over that and kind of look at this film for what it was trying to be and not what they wanted it to be, I think a lot more people are going to enjoy this movie um, for what it is.
me see what time I have here. 1.38, good. Um, four. I mean, I've already said it, um, and it goes without saying, but I'll, 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 I'll throw this in just to, to add some heat to this flame war fire. <clears throat> Amanda fucking Waller. Viola Davis. I am now a fan of this woman after watching the movie. Um, I'd never bothered to watch um, her TV show. Um, uh, what, what's it called? Get how, uh, how to Get Away with Murder. She's a badass in that. I, start, I, I watched a couple of her other movies. Amanda fucking Waller. Now, here's what I'm going to say about this. Best comic villain in a movie since The Joker in The Dark Knight. If you can come up... I, I can't think of any. I cannot think of any. I always thought um, the comedian from The Watchmen and um, Ozzy Mendes are very, very underrated villains in a comic book movie. Um, I'd say more the comedian than Ozzy Mendes, uh, but like I think they were really, really underrated in that movie. Um, but apart from that, I cannot think of any other I mean you could say Loki but I really think Loki is highly overrated I really do I don't think he's that great he's just funny and um, Tom Hiddleston he does the lines well but how's his character that much different from uh, you know people say that um, Ultron was bad and all he was was just this witty funny guy but that's, that, that's basically what uh, you know uh, Loki is it's just a series of one-liners. He's this normal, formulaic Marvel stuff that they do. That's what they like to do. So, for me, I don't know. I don't know. Whatever you want to say, I don't think. Um, I don't think Loki's that great. Um, I don't think Bane was that great. I think Bane was a terrible villain. I think. Um, I think the Zod was a terrible villain. I think it's, by now, it almost goes without saying that all of the Marvel villains have been a bunch of waste, uh, like a bunch of pussies. They're just a waste of time. They're a waste of time. They may as well not be in the movies. They may as well just have the heroes in Marvel fight themselves. Because the, the heroes in the Marvel movies, I'm not talking about the Sony Marvel movies, you know, or anything like that, or the X-Men, I'm talking about specifically Marvel, Disney movies. The villains in those movies, <clears throat> the villains in those movies are so generic that even when I say that, you know, a DC villain is better than them, that's not even a compliment to me. That's just me, like, my... My niece is a better villain than the, than the villains in... Like, my little niece, when she, does, when she bullies, you know, her little brother a little bit, she's a better villain than the villain in, in the Marvel movies. And she's, like, one of the sweetest girls in the world. But when she bullies her brother, she does more wicked stuff than the guys in the Marvel movies. She usually looks after him, but sometimes she... That's what I'm talking about. They're that generic, vanilla... Oh, we're not going to, um, you know, we're not going to uh, offend anyone. One note, terrible villains. And they use such great actors to play them as well. And it's like, why would you even go out and hire the guy who was um, Captain Zemo, who was a great actor? Why would you go out and hire him to play that part? If you're just going to make it that part, he sucked. So if I say Lex Luthor... For instance, you might go, oh, Lex Luthor, he's terrible. Even if I say Lex Luthor's better than him, or better than the, the villains in the Marvel movies, it's only because I remember that. Like, that's all you have to do to be better than a villain in a Marvel movie, is be remembered. So, um, that, that's it for me. I, I mean, like, so, Amanda Waller, now, now this is a compliment, though. Amanda Waller is one of the best villains I've seen in a comic book movie, period, period. I, 
I, I think she's up there. I think she's up there um, in the top in the top ten. Uh, I'm not sure where. I can't figure out. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna kind of uh, go run over it in my head. Uh, but I know that both Jack Nicholson and, um, and and Heath Ledger's Jokers are in there. As as one of the top tens, so maybe if I go for a list, I know I think the comedian is. Um, you know, uh, what other villains have been really good? I know I think the guy from Blade was pretty good. The first Blade was was a really good villain. You know, uh, maybe the chick from Dread. I don't know. The the, the, the there's not a hell of a lot of um, villains in comic book movies um, where you're like, wow, that villain was just epic, you know. Um, so, you know, I think she's up there in the top ten. She was epic. Everything she did was badass. When she just, when they, when they showed that screen of, her, like, my favourite bit, my favourite bit, and this scene wasn't even about her. This is how good Viola Davis is. All she was told to do was, um, I bet you it says in the script, something like um, Amanda Waller uh, goes up um, to El Diablo's um, water cell and um, she shows him uh, the image of him incinerating uh, the people on the uh, in the prison in the in the prison yard and then she is supposed to say a line she made that scene epic she just was like this isn't you this you know like like some badass interrogating co like she just made that scene epic and then she's just standing at the back like you know as uh as the other guy starts talking to her old diablo he says let me take over and he starts talking to her and she's just standing in the back like <laughs> like she's so pissed off and she's just epic she's epic 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 i couldn't have thought like i used to love the justice league amanda waller she was really really good but I think I think Viola Davis is better than even her, even her, as amazing as she was. So couldn't have done better with Amanda Waller. Um, now my fifth thing that I'm going to say, and this is the last thing I'm going to say about the, the, the movie, um, I love the fact that the tone is so different from BVS, and this gives me, this is what I want from DC because I think whether they're making bad movies or good movies. The fact, like even Man of Steel, the Man of Steel tone was different. It was even, the Man of Steel tone was very different to the Batman v Superman tone. Because I, like, they were, they had a slightly different tone. And then this Suicide Squad is even more different, you know. And I really think they should keep on doing that. The Wonder Woman movie looks very, very different as well. I really, really think they should keep on doing that. And if we, if we corner them into you know uh, a hole where they think oh well these guys um you know they just want funny um generic movies um if we corner them into that hole that's what we're going to start getting you know dc and marvel are going to be exactly the same and what you're going to what's going to happen is people are going to get bored. They're going to get bored of the, 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 the dumb villains, the, 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 the terrible, unmemorable villains. They're going to get bored of everyone having their one-liners. You know, like, that's what we'll be counting for. You know, could character development is that, oh, how many one-liners do I have in this script? Oh, I've got a, I've got a zinger there. Ooh, ooh. Batman doing his, you know, it's going to go back to that. Like, you know, you've got this great Batman right now in um, in Ben Affleck. And um, you're going to go back to um, the George Clooney Batman because everyone's pressuring them into making these funny comic movies. I mean, comic in the funny sense. It's a bad idea and it's a dangerous route to go down and it will kill these movies dead. The fact that DC had a plan that they were going to have more artist-driven movies than Marvel, 
was a good idea and I think it, it follows in the structure of what Marvel was initially and what DC was initially because Marvel, what was Marvel? Marvel was basically a bunch, like basically Stan Lee and a couple of other guys who made um, all of these characters, you know, um, all of these great iconic characters, Captain America, Spider-Man, all of those fantastic characters that they made, Hulk, but they made them all the same time. They were all these kind of like fun, um, kind of space age, science kind of um, fiction kind of characters, you know, with their radioactive spiders and getting hit by gamma rays and, uh, and you know, Fantastic Four with the cosmic rays from going up in space. They were all born out of this kind of cosmic age of, from the mind of one person. Whereas DC is very different because DC um, it was different artists who came up with these 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 hero myths that were almost um, you know like the kind of Greek uh, um, uh, you know Greek and Roman uh, mythology um, the, these these kind of you know they were made for kids obviously but there was something actually underlying them that was quite universal and archetypical. Um, that, that kind of followed that kind of mold of the kind of Herculean hero or, or, or the Achilles style hero, um, you know, um, and they, they, they created these, these little children's stories. But what happened is people found out, like, actually, there's something a little bit deeper about that man. There's something a little bit deeper about Superman when you think about it. And you can make all these kind of interesting stories about it. So it was all these different sets of artists who came to who 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 separately created, uh, you know, Wonder Woman. Um, so one of them created Flash. One of them created Green Lantern. Another one created Superman. Um, you know, Joe Shuster, um, uh, Bob Finger with um, Batman. So they were all very very. Uh, you know, different people creating it. So it only makes sense that with the films um, of DC, rather than having this kind of one figure who's making them all be these kind of generic, kind of safe, enjoyable family movies, that they follow how DC was initially um, conceived and have different sets of artists be responsible for creating a universe that is one universe, but at the same time, you know, can have very, very, a very, very different aesthetic. I mean, I love the aesthetic of Batman v Superman. No matter what you want to say, the cinematography was beautiful. And it was epic, epic cinematography that made everything look um, like this, 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 as I said, this Greek mythology. It created this kind of Greek mythology out of these modern comic book characters. Whereas, um, you know, Suicide Squad is like got this kind of B movie influence and it's fun and it's youthful and it's kind of this acid drenched, rainbow coloured, sexy, energetic, you know, uh, purple rain kind of, you know, electric mess. I, I, and I, I loved it. I thought it was drenched in cool um, and it was eye popping and it was. As I said, you know, uh, that there was, that, uh, it, it was tenacious. Um, and I feel like for the five reasons I've told you, um, that given that even if you thought this movie was bad, the fact that it was attempting to do all of the five things that I've told you, you know, having this uh, strong black woman as a villain, you know, one of the best black, even if you don't want to give Amanda Waller the best, one of the top 10 villains, you've got to admit, one of the, the great kind of um, roles for a black woman uh, that you'll see in a mainstream movie ever. You know, that's, that's a good thing. Um, the great characters, the diversity of the characters, the, 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 the style and um, the, uh, and um, both the style and the kind of color and, and texture of the movie, um, um, and uh, y you know, it was made with a lot of heart and a lot of love, um, 
yes, Warner Brothers put their hand in the cookie jar. I don't think they should have. But in the end, I think what we, what we got in the cinematic release, I'm happy with. Um, I'd love to see a director's cut. I think we all would. <laughs> no one could deny that. Even those who don't like it want to see the director's cut. So, you know, for me, I don't understand. Like, when I first heard that um, people didn't like Ma uh, Batman v Superman, I kind of understood. When people started attacking Suicide Squad and I watched Suicide Squad, I was like, okay, there's a bias against DC. There's a bias against DC movies. And I felt passionate, I had to write about this because I think we all want these films to continue. So um, that, that's my piece um, on Suicide Squad. Um, it's the most epic review I know, but um, that, 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 that's my feeling towards it. I'm gonna try and cut this down and edit it and hopefully um, we can make it shorter. <laughs>